Luc Besson's The Fifth Element, a passion project the director first started writing at just 16, would finally see the light of day in 1997. While dividing critics between elation and irritation, it was also one of the highest grossing films of that year, and consequently, a video game adaptation seemed inevitable, especially with its rich sci-fi world. The PlayStation 1 game wouldn't arrive until more than a year after the film's release, but with film company Galmont assisting, it certainly offered more promise. Sadly, the belated movie tie-in would result in another displeasing licensed game on a console full of them. Dodgy gameplay mechanics, a poorly structured campaign, and unbalanced difficulty make it far more frustrating than fun, and its few bright spots struggle to shine through all of these woes. Loosely structured around the titular film, the fifth element puts you in the shoes of two characters. Corbin Dallas is a taxi driver turned hero after the other protagonist, Lilu, crashes into his cab after escaping a lab. It concerns five elements which are needed to protect the Earth from a great incoming evil, but our heroes must contend with Zorg and his hired goons as they try to save the planet. However, like many other tie-ins on the console, the story is borderline butchered as short FMV clips add some context to each mission, but fail to tell a cohesive narrative. If you try to experience this story without prior knowledge of the film, it makes almost no sense, akin to studying a clockwork orange while reading the book upside down. Nonetheless, there are 16 stages present, and mostly entail the same general structure. As either character, you explore fairly large levels while seeking out key items, dealing with thugs in combat, and partaking in platforming. While initially controlling Corbin, you eventually swap to Lilu, and their styles do vary somewhat. Corbin can wield firearms such as handguns, assault rifles, and even an electricity gun to combat foes, and it somewhat resembles a run-and-gun game. In contrast, Lilu remains unarmed, but can perform hand-to-hand -hand combos and throw grenades, but her gameplay is more geared towards platforming and exploration. It could have offered an incentive for replays, perhaps like Resident Evil's two character systems. Instead, the structure is a bit more laborious. After the first three missions, the selection screen allows you to choose between characters, but it's less of a choice and more like deciding which character to clear first, as you're required to beat the same level twice as each protagonist. Unfortunately, the levels themselves aren't different enough to prevent this from growing tedious, as while there is some divergence due to differing abilities, for example, Lilu can crawl into smaller gaps, you'll still be retreading so much ground. There's so much crossover, in fact, that levels often feature the same secret areas and pickups, even if some items, such as psionic blasts, can't be used by both. While this means there's superficially 24 levels instead of just 16, it all feels cheaply padded. Not even a fun couple of levels, such as shooting ringing foam bombs in frantic fashion, can make up for all the filler. Of course, a sturdy game could perhaps ease these structural woes, but unfortunately, the core mechanics are far from optimal. The camera is the biggest fawn here, a woeful system which struggles to keep up with any part of the experience. It gets stuck on walls, awkwardly changes without notice, and is slow to reset behind your character, and makes most actions more difficult. Combat, be it shooting or melee, is clunky, with ropey collision detection which sometimes sees your strikes flying past foes or shots missing point blank. Platforming is also dire, 
as the aforementioned camera woes and unreliable jumps lead to a lot of deaths. This ties nicely into the live system, which carries over between characters and can be replenished by finding secret areas. The problem is that the difficulty is wildly inconsistent, with some levels being a breeze and others suffering from numerous instant death hazards. It can cause massive headaches when, after losing a ton of lives, you are either forced to replay levels and hope to avoid death, or enter the next stage at a disadvantage. All of these woes add up to a miserable experience. The fifth element sadly isn't easy on the eyes either. By 1998 standards, there's a lot of issues that drag down the film's distinctive style. Pop-in is rife, even in interior levels, and can see you getting shot but not knowing where from. Textures and levels look very grainy and some parts look like they could almost fall apart with seams noticeably sticking out. Character models look okay, and protagonists even change clothing like in the film, but there's only a handful of enemy models present, and they often look and animate roughly. Even stages that see flying cars and the futuristic metropolis somehow look poor. The sound fares better, mostly due to the soundtrack. Mixing original tracks with select songs from the film's soundtrack they managed to build some atmosphere and even prove quite catchy. One original track, which often plays during time limited levels, is almost a toe tapper. The effects can often be harsh though, with explosions and gunfire overwhelming everything else, and there's very little voice work during gameplay outside of occasional grunts some canned lines before you begin a mission, and an ear-piercing scream from Ruby Rod every time you start a level. The fifth element, even by PlayStation 1 licensed game standards, would get blasted by critics at the time. In retrospect, it's easy to see why. A haphazardly assembled, tediously padded and mostly joyless experience from beginning to end, only a handful of fun moments pop up during the dozen or so hours of gameplay. However, these are nowhere near enough to earn a recommendation. Coupled with a wildly inconsistent difficulty, no real content outside of completing the campaign and a poor presentation, this effort flunks on almost every front. Even fans of the film will get little out of the monstrously chopped retelling of the story. Like listening to Ruby Rod for 10 hours on loop, you should avoid this one at all costs. <laughs> 